for the last few years. Some estimates have it as high as 20 or 30 percent top of our economy. But they're not just building housing. They're building cities. Yes, that's right. Giant yeah. cities being built with people not coming to live here. Yes, I think they're building somewhere between 12 and 24 new cities every single year. Unlike our market-driven economy, in China, it's the government that has spent some $2 trillion to get these cities built as a way of keeping the economy growing. The assumption is if you build it, they'll come. But no one's coming. This is really completely, totally empty, and it goes up. Gillum took us to this shopping mall that's been standing vacant for three years. Can I find this all over China? Yes, you can. They've simply built too much infrastructure too quickly. But I see KFC behind you. Yep. I see Starbucks over there. I see some other very recognizable American franchises coming in here. Yeah. At least they, does that mean they have faith that, that this is going to ignite? No, these are all fake signs. This is to give potential buyers the they're, impression of what it might look like if they moved it. They're not real. So KFC didn't they buy have. this space or rent this space? No, they haven't. Starbucks? No. They just put the sign up? That's right. It's all make-believe, non-existent supply for non-existent demand. Look at that. Swarovski, PIA, they're hoping for a high-end, too. H&M, Zara. <laughs> it's all Potemkin. Yeah. It's surreal, and it's everywhere, like the city of Ordos in Mongolia, built for a million people who didn't show up. And no, you're not in England. You're in Thamestown, a development near Shanghai built like an English village. Uh, and it was finished, I think, around five or six years ago. And it must have cost uh, close to a billion US dollars. And you'll see it's still standing there empty. Well, I've heard that there is some industry there, or some business, one business there. Marriage. Wedding pictures, <laughs> right? And what's more uplifting than a wedding, or 10? You can see these empty developments on the edge of almost every city in China. What about the idea that China is urbanizing? People are flooding into cities, or want to anyway, from the rural areas, by the hundreds of millions. Yeah. And that this really is a smart move, build a housing, to accommodate the urbanization process. Well, so people are being moved into the cities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can afford these apartments, which, you know, cost 100,000 US dollars or whatever. I mean, these are poor people moving into the city, so they're building the wrong sort of apartments. And what's worse, to build all these massive cities, they've had to tear down what was there before, clearing rice fields and displacing, by some counts, tens of millions of villagers. On the edge of Zhengzhou, Gillam and I came upon a strange sight. I'm just watching what they're doing. Do you have any idea? I think they're trying to recycle the bricks. These villagers are salvaging what's left of their homes, bulldozed to make room for more empty condos, already encroaching in the distance. There are all these empty apartments over here. Can they conceivably move into those upscale places? Most people in China live in banks for less than two dollars a day, and these apartments probably cost upwards of fifty or sixty thousand US dollars, so very unlikely. What will happen to them, do you think? They'll be forced to relocate somewhere. I have no idea where they'll go. These are the immediate casualties of the building boom. And there's another problem. Analysts warn that all this building has created a bubble that could burst. So if the bubble bursts, <coughs> who's left holding the bag? There are multiple classes of people that are going to get wiped out by this. Um, people who have invested three generations worth of savings, so grandparents, parents, and children into properties, will see their savings evaporate. And then, of course, there's 50 million construction workers who are working on all these projects around China. The prognosis of a bubble about to burst isn't only coming from financial gloom and doomers. We heard it from the most unlikely source. Are you the biggest home builder in the world. Yes, I think uh, maybe. Maybe? Uh, yes, uh, only the quantity, not quality. Wang yeah. sure is modest, but his company, Banky, is a $53 billion real estate empire building more homes than anyone in China. He was born on the front lines of communism and joined the Red Army, but he secretly read forbidden books about capitalism so that when China liberalized its economy, 
He rushed to the front lines of the free market. Even he thinks today's situation is out of control. Are homes in China too expensive today? No. Here, yeah. Here's a number that I saw. A typical apartment in Shanghai uh -huh. cost about 45 times the average residence annual salary. Even higher. Even what higher. does that mean for your economy if, if, if it's just too expensive for the vast majority of people? So I think that uh, uh, dangerous. Dangerous. That's the um, bubble. So I think that's the problem. Is there a bubble? Uh, yes, of course. There is a bubble. And the issue is, will it burst or not? Yes. That's the big yes. issue. If there's a bubble, that, uh, that's a disaster. If it burst? If it burst, that's a disaster. To try and prevent the disaster, the Chinese government decided to act. Heard of their one-child policy? Since 2011, China has had what amounts to a one-apartment policy, where it's very hard to buy more than one apartment in major cities. Because of this, prices plunged. The bubble was being tamed. And yet, the taming was creating all kinds of unintended consequences. Are many developers in debt? Yes. And are many stopping development in the middle of projects? Because they don't have the money to go forward. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. That, uh, that's a huge problem. A problem because the slowing down of construction led to a downturn in the overall economy. Unfinished projects dot China, and not just apartment buildings. Look at this. Can you believe it? Analyst Ann Stevenson Yang, who has traveled like across Earth. China, Here's showed us a giant project all but abandoned in the port city of Tianjin with concrete skeletons as far as the eye can see. The plan is to build a new financial district to rival Manhattan, including a Lincoln Center and a World Trade Center, only taller. But it all seems frozen. There's supposed to be a Rockefeller Center here. I hope they have a Christmas tree, too. <laughs> Skating rink. City officials told us everything stopped because developers want to build all the facades at once to match. But on the ground, we heard a different explanation. Workers told us that many of these buildings haven't had any work done on them for weeks, months, as if the developers just don't have the money to go on. It's true. You see that happen first, that migrant workers will go home. That's often the first sign that the debt crisis is starting. The debt crisis. Well, when you stop the paying your bills, then everything stops. It could become a debt crisis because of the huge loans most of the developers took out. If they can't repay them, the whole economy will seize up. The government's great fear is that all this could lead to social unrest, and that's not hypothetical. Last year, when home prices fell, it infuriated all those owners of multiple dwellings who watched the value of their nest eggs plummet. And there's already been some demonstrations yes. over real estate around the country. Yeah. Have you had demonstrations <coughs> against your showrooms anywhere? Your company? Often. So often, Wang sure shudders to think what would happen if the bubble actually burst. If that uh, bubble break, that may be, who knows what will happen. Maybe that, that maybe I answer, maybe next the Arabic screen. Arabic screen? Arabic. You mean people coming out and demonstrating? Mm -hmm. A lot of economists say that it's too big for even this government to control. Uh -huh. I believe the top leaders uh, have the enough uh, smart to deal with that. You think uh, you're, you're uh, praying they do. Uh, you're going like uh, that. But that's uncertain. Meanwhile, people who can afford it are still buying as much real estate as they can. They're even finding ways around the one apartment restriction in big cities. Can't buy in Beijing? Just cross the city line, and the boom is in full swing. Flyers advertising new projects, potential buyers crowding buses to see new construction, and new owners line up to register their new apartments. Like us in our bubble, they just don't believe the good times will ever end.
Go to 60minutesovertime.com to hear what one of the richest women in China has to say about criticizing her sorry, government, the, uh, sponsored by Viagra. Yeah, sorry about the inappropriate. So, does that blow your mind a little bit? It almost seems as if um, over the last 40 years, since they've seen such an increase, that they've almost maybe plateaued, and now they have all this extra that maybe isn't even going to get sold. Yeah, it, but you know what? It's not really 40 years even. It's more constricted than that. It's more, it's more like 20 years since uh, Japan opened the economy um, and, and things exploded. Uh, and then any other impressions, things that just hit you as young business students? Or maybe you're not, maybe I was misinformed. Maybe you're, maybe, maybe it's a physics class that I'm taking. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, well, like, maybe that's like kind of very similar to like what happened here. Like, the market just kept on going up, and so people just bought and bought. And as it went up, and then it fell. Did you pick up, why are they buying 10 apartments? What, what was that about? Did you, did you get that news, John? I mean, just so they could potentially sell the profits or... Well, why don't they invest in other things? Because he said it's the price of rising fast. Yeah, and any, anything else? They don't, they, don't the they don't allow them to invest in other things. Oh. They don't allow them to invest abroad. Did you, did you pick up those nuances? Remember, we're talking about a state-controlled economy, as opposed to what is our economy? A market-driven economy, right? So get those things clearly in your head. If you don't have those things down on paper, ours is a market-driven economy, OK? Theirs is a state-controlled economy. So like this isn't something. I debated showing you this because I thought maybe you'll see that I'm putting China in a negative light, and I'm not trying to do that, and I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm not a public figure, so I'm not a blogger or somebody that bashes an economy of the world, but we, one of our major impressions was this empty city syndrome. Well, I didn't know any of that. I didn't watch that prior to going. So you're just seeing this for the first time? Uh, well, I saw, I've seen something like that, Okay, uh, but since we've returned, because I, I couldn't explain it you know, to <laughs> I showed the pictures to my sons, I couldn't explain why, so I wanted to go figure out why. You know, the taxi driver that you're talking to doesn't really speak a lot of English, so he, he couldn't explain all of that. Even. Why are we driving through 50 high-rise, empty buildings with no lights on? It's eerie at nighttime. Man, you know, it's got this otherworldly thing going on. And I had seen this before going, actually. I think are about the same time. I can't, I can't remember exactly, just one Sunday night, because I tend to have 60 minutes on. And um, it was real, I guess. This isn't 60 minutes going out, digging up you know, some empty buildings and putting them up. It was a massive impression for us. It's probably my biggest post-China impression. Like, what's with the empty buildings, dude? You know, what is going on? So we were at Hong Kong Airport coming back, and, and it just happened that the guy next to me going through security was English speaking, and he said hello, and I said hello, and he turned, we introduced ourselves, and he turned out to be an architect who graduated from UCLA, a Chinese guy, Chinese national, who worked for a mega company, and so, you know, couldn't resist saying to him, so like, what is going to happen? What's going to happen with, with this overbuilt thing that you have? And he goes, do you remember? He said, oh, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's not overbuilt. All right. Uh, explain it to me, Lucy. You know, uh, what's going on here? And so he said, well, we got caught last time with not having enough housing. We have a billion and a half people. When, when they are moving into the city and there's no place for them, they're going to keep coming. But I think he's wrong. I really do. I think he's wrong. I think, all right, and I don't know if you would agree or not, does this seem like it's heading for a meltdown yeah. to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and do you know that if China melts down, like, 
Is anyone naive enough to think that has no impact on us? Like, no one's naive enough to think that, right? It's a, it's a global economy. You're in a global economics class. Like, if, if China melts down, remember the, the, the biggest builder in China, I mean, he could hardly find the words, <laughs> the bubble bursts. Like, remember they were alluding to, like, Arab Spring and concepts like that, that uh, who knows what might happen. We're talking social unrest. You know, we're talking again that you have to go back to the nature of it. Why would they, if that was market driven, would they build empty cities? No, no not a chance. Not a chance would they build empty cities if it was a, a market driven economy. You know, I want to make sure that I have buyers for everything. I'm going to do my, my studies, my demographics, my measurements to ensure that I probably am going to pre-sell the darn things. But when I don't allow anyone to invest in anything other than Chinese assets like apartments, the stock market is controlled by the Communist Party. The stock market is literally controlled by the party. So are you going to invest in a market that is controlled by the government? Probably not. You know, you're probably going to go to the New York Stock Exchange and you're going to invest in the Dow or something like that, but you're not going to play the game of trusting a, a, a communist or not even any government because they can tinker with your economy just too easily. So impressions, like impressions are, are I'm just coming in today to try to give you an idea about a global economic world that you literally as business majors are probably going to inhabit. And obviously we're not saying don't play with China. You're actually saying to be functional in the future economy, you're probably going to have to play with China. And maybe those cities are all going to populate. But it's a government that's making the decisions. It's not an individual or a little private corporation. You know, it's a government that's driving that because that keeps 50 million construction workers working. You know, that keeps driving the economy. We have to keep driving. Okay, you have to keep feeding the beast. If the Chinese economy is a beast. You have to keep feeding it. So, I don't know. Another problem, be because China, and this is something I want you to think about, because China is run by the government, and not speculators, like what happened on Wall Street for us. It was a lot of speculation. Um, they avoided our crises, our almost global crises. China came flying through it because they weren't in our economic world at the time. They weren't playing the same game that we were. They were much more conservative, okay? So they weren't riding that boom that happened in the 90s the way we were and, and the early 2000s. They weren't on that wave because they were more conservative. So they're a very planned economy. Now, I just want you to think for a minute. And I'm sure Mr. Gideon talks a lot about risk and return and things like that. Creativity, uh, for you as young guys and girls who are going out into the world, creativity is probably going to come into um, making best guesses, you know, developing scenarios, figuring out what might be the hot new commodity, trying to see around the corner. You're going to take certain risks if you're going to be successful economically. You know, the people who hit it, it's, it's not by being conservative. That's not how you create, you know, global assets. So when a government is doing it, you don't have the creative forces, the creative juices that would be at play in a market-driven economy like ours. So that's another thing to think about, whether their economy is going to be stifled by government, inter not intervention, government direction, because it's not intervention. <coughs> if they don't like the way the stock market is going, if, if inflation is growing, you know, they change the price of food. 
they changed, they say you can only own one apartment. Like, it's easy there. But it's also devastating to the investor. There's a similar thing, I don't know if you know much about Indian culture, in India that is, so to speak. I don't know if you know that India, when a bride gets married, what she is gifted with is gold, okay? Gold is like India. If you see pictures of people in India, a lot of their expression of wealth is in the amount of gold that they wear and gold that they have in their houses. And it's wonderful, isn't it, if you're in gold these days because the price is going up? So they don't invest in apartments. <laughs> the price just went down. Yeah, but if, I said if the price is going up. Oh, if the price is yeah. going up. But the they don't down. invest in apartments typically in India. They invest in gold. And if the gold market plunges, they don't even have an answer to, like, what would we do if the gold market... Like, if the gold market plunges, India is an absolute mess. So there, there are just forces at work in the global economic world that I'm sure you've been exposed to a lot of them that, that are phenomenal in terms of how they will impact you and the decisions that you make um, going forward into like the economy that, that is going to exist in five years' time when you're getting out of college and how you're going to play in it. It's, it's going to be interesting. So I want to go back to the article that I had for you earlier, this particular article. And um, just to read some different views of, you know, these are all like quick and dirty, okay? The second one, the Chinese government controls the majority of large companies. In many fields, the industry's resources have been accumulated and controlled by several state-owned monopolistic enterprises. According to China Ministry of Finance, assets of all state enterprises were total about six trillion, okay? That's an amazing amount of money, way more than any place else in the world. The government's increased involvement in sectors from coal mining to the internet has spawned the phrase, and I can't pronounce it in Chinese, but the state advances, the private sector retreats. So, in other words, what's good, it's not what's good for GM is good for America, you know, which is what our economy was kind of built on back in the day. What's good for the state isn't good for GM in China. In other words, private sector de-emphasized, the state sector emphasized. Okay, this one I want to get down into here. This one, the Chinese government can manipulate the economy in ways the Western governments can't. In 2008, for example, when the housing market was starting to overheat, it simply ordered banks to reduce the number of housing loans. Great. You can't do that here. But those guys better know what they're doing. When, sa when sales slow down too much, it offered market incentives like lower taxes on home purchase. The Chinese government also can do things like order large state industries to buy new assets at home and abroad. The Chinese bureaucracy dislikes the unpredictable nature, mar uh, the nature of market economy and does its best to control it by controlling prices and production. China's faith in its ability to mold markets may derive from the fact that its leaders are mostly engineers trained to build from a plan. Now, no offense to engineers, but they're not always the most creative, you know? Following a plan and translating that into following an economic plan. That's what Russia, you know, you're too young to know anything about this, but the Soviet Socialist Republic, they always had a five-year plan. Like, it got old after a while. Well, the new five-year plan, you know, it never amounted to anything. Okay, that's more or less the history of it. So, I want you now to do some writing. I want you to just maybe take five or six points that made an impression on you today, because I want to have a deliverable for Mr. Gideon when he comes back. And just take them, write them, we'll share some of them. But try to, try to prioritize them. Write them first, like be brief. Take some things. We're, we're looking at the Chinese market, elements of its economy, to show that you understand what is unique and different about China's economy. Show us that you know what is unique and different about China's economy.
Bullets are fine. You don't have to have paragraphs. And I'll be asking you to share some of those with us. I want to ensure that you learn something today. Are you getting things written? Yeah. Okay, you'll be sharing it here in a couple of minutes. I'll show the biggest star wars picture. Yeah, you can show that from I walk around. Chicken feet. I'm not talking about thighs or legs. I'm talking about the actual feet. <laughs> and you eat the whole thing. There's, there's it's, bone? it's not bone. That's not bone. That's more like <laughs> tendon. These are the entire bowl of chicken feet. You eat the entire, entire leg. But, I'm sorry. Not that I didn't know what it was. It's hard to look at it. It's spicy too. It's completely unavailable. This was the thing, actually, this is 
Yeah. You can tell much to see here. This is frog legs and lotus uh, flowers. And Brother Tommy, you know the answer to this? Lotus flowers, because Brother Tommy, you know, frogs. That question. He doesn't think it's very exotic. I grew up in Southern California. We don't eat a lot of frog legs. I will truly eat anything. This is truly well. And my kids. The pigeon that Brother Tommy ate. Do you have the one pigeon's head looking back at you? Yeah, this is the pigeon's head. Brother yeah. Tom, when you were in Australia, did you have kangaroo? What? I did. I, you know what? I eat everything. Yeah. <laughs> I like kangaroo. I'll, I'll eat whatever you said before me. It's, 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 that's in the gospel where Jesus says, eat whatever is set before you. This used to be a pigeon in the street. I eat whatever is set before you. This is my favorite part, just what Brother Tom would eat. It would be, I would send back things to my staff and say, today Brother Tom ate, you know, dot, dot, dot. Um, the, the snake on the stick was pretty amazing. Yeah. Brother Tom would eat uh, snake meat. Um, I don't pay much attention to, like, the origin of the food, you know? It's good food. They're eating it. If a billion and a half Chinese eat it, it's got to be good enough for BT, so, <laughs> so I'm going to eat it, and I'm going to like it. I'm actually going to like it. The spice in uh, Chengdu, I mean, that is in uh, Sichuan province, which is associated with the, uh, the spiciest part of China. The one thing you didn't try, which I was actually thankful for, were this, these were um, rabbit heads that they cook the rabbit, and they take the skin off the head, and they put the head on a stick. Um, to eat, and it's all covered with spice. And you can see the, um, if you pay close attention, you can see the teeth there. This is for Mr. Gideon to see the uh, rabbit's teeth. These are all rabbit heads. He did not eat rabbit heads. There sick. are things that I won't eat. I won't eat. He drew the line at the rabbit head and the teeth in it. For moral reasons. I have to be on model. Because a lot of veal is unborn calf and milk fed. I grew up on a farm. And I just don't think it's right. I just, I, I have moral issues with some of those things, so I don't eat it. But um, rabbit. Uh, did you eat again, the quail on the stick? The spicy quail on the stick? Yeah, I did. I I'll so eat all that, but I won't eat veal or, or, or rabbit. These are two things quail. I won't eat because I don't think we should be spicy. They're too cute. I like them. I obviously won't eat dog. And, you know. But in the norm, like of the exotic, I'll eat everything. I haven't eaten it, but I would not think twice about it. Because I don't have, you know how you have associations? You might have had a pet guinea pig. Well, I didn't. I don't have a particular life for guinea pigs, so I'll eat them. Ostrich, well, you have ostrich murders. Yeah, the sink water to brush your teeth. Well, you use the sink water. But yeah, the water is not trustworthy, so I can't find it. I uh, <laughs> I didn't get sick at all. Did you drink tap water? No, no. And the one thing I want to do is I want to go into the country in China on a future visit. So I have to figure out that water part. You know, how do you cover the water part? Some people say when you go to a country like Mexico, for example, just drink the water and get sick. Like if you're staying for a long time, just deal with it and then you're sick, and then you can drink the water because it's a parasite or a bacteria. And once your body adjusts to it, then go for it. But I'm not quite ready because uh, I don't want to spend two days being sick. You know, that's, that's not a pleasurable thing. We brought Cipro with us. I don't know what, what the rest of the name is, but Cipro stops diarrhea, so I'm I, I still am fine. I didn't use it. I didn't use it. Either. But Rob was, you were both hungry and thirsty most of the time in China. And hot. And hot. Yes. Hungry and thirsty. And you're either hot. not conserve electricity, so the air conditioning in major hotels will not doesn't come on till May first. May first. So you, yeah. you can turn the dial all you want. There's no May first is air conditioning day. So um, there's just a lot of unique cultural things that I fully respect. I mean, if a country decides air conditioning doesn't come on till May first, fine by me, John. What was your main goal? We went to China to investigate the bringing over of Chinese national students to Shamanat, middle school and high school, uh, in the future. That was our main goal in going there. So we were working with an agency called 3W that we had contacted, that I met up here about two years ago. A guy came to my office. They work with Modern Day and other schools, so we went to Modern Day and checked out what was happening. So our goal is to bring over a approximately 10 7th graders, 10 8th graders, and 10 9th graders to Xiaomang. Uh, 
you know, for various reasons. One is for enrollment management, because I don't know if you know, we're at the maximum enrollment we've ever been at Chaminade. It's the highest enrollment we've ever been. But every demographic out there is against us. Do you know what I mean by demographics? Every population, uh, whatever you call it, like the number of students who are graduating from Catholic schools is declining all the elementary schools. Some of the schools are terribly under-enrolled. Some of them are, like St. B is fully enrolled in St. Melbourne. A lot of them are grossly under-enrolled. Um, the overall youth age population for high school is declining in our area. Um, schools like Sierra Canyon have started high schools, used to be a middle school only, and used to send a lot of their kids. We still get a lot, but then every time a charter school or a magnet school opens in your area, there is actually a there's actually a percentage loss in your market share. So what we're trying to do is we're if if we weren't measuring trends, you know, if, if Shamat just ignored that, we would say if we have the maximum enrollment we ever have, we're just fine. But we're always trying to think ahead, you know, of like, well, if we do have a ding, which every factor looks like we're going to get a ding in enrollment, that like that we're going to have a drop. So what would we do differently? And so that's why we want to experiment with bringing over some check. Now, we, we have several international students. You know Jack and you can know about all those guys that are here uh, from China. And we have kids from Korea. And we've had kids from Vietnam. So we've always had six, seven, eight kids. But what we want to do is formalize the program. So we went over there to interview kids, actually, to meet with agents. China is very much an agent system. Uh, like these people identify people who bring it up to another agency who maybe deals with another agency who deals with Shamanat. You know, so we don't go to China and hang up a sign that says, Shamanat's here, anyone interested, come on over. We wouldn't be able to do that. There are some schools who do it, I think it's a disaster. So we're looking to bring over to students, we're looking to homestay them here, like with families, and they will pay for it. So we sent out a letter to your parents, actually, in case they might be interested. We got a lot of good response to that. So that was our...